We'll just start. The desire to be free from the limits of the human experience is as old as our first stories. We exist in an endless universe, only bound by the laws of physics, and yet our consciousness is trapped in mortal machines made of meat. With the breathtaking explosion of innovation and progress, for the first time, the concept of leaving our flesh piles behind and uploading our minds into a digital utopia seems possible, even like the logical next step on our evolutionary ladder. Mind uploading and digital immortality are some of the core themes of the game Cyberpunk 2077. It plays in a grim dystopian future where humanity has progressed far beyond today's technology and explores what this could mean for humanity. About a year ago, CD Projekt Red asked us if we would like to make a video about some of these ideas and we were immediately on board. So, let's explore this topic together. Is it possible to upload your mind into a computer? Well, it's complicated. I can already tell you, if it were possible, I would not be interested. But that is just my initial response, so I'm open to hearing new information. And when I saw the title of this video, it's called, Can You Upload Your Mind and Live Forever? I thought it would be a good follow-up to the previous video where we spoke about immortality. So here we are. Upload what exactly? Mind is one of those words that are really hard to define. It's thought to be the collective abilities of your consciousness and intelligence, the thing that lets you imagine, recognize, and dream. Mind uploading is the hypothetical concept of making a copy of this inner world and transferring it into a computer to run a simulation of your consciousness. But even defining the premise gets really hard, really fast. The possibility of mind uploading is based on three assumptions. Assumption one, your mind is in your brain's structure, arrangement, and biochemistry. The idea that everything about the mind can be found in the brain is called physicalism, and it keeps our discussion within the domain of natural law. Assumption two, at some point, we will understand the brain well enough and possess the technology to simulate all of its aspects to make a digital mind copy. Assumption three, computer software can host your mind which means the mind is computable. There is no physical property in the brain, including consciousness, that cannot be simulated accurately, even if it requires a lot of code. All of these assumptions have been proposed and challenged by scientists and philosophers, and they remain the subject of passionate debate. With so many fundamental questions still unanswered, it's hard to discuss the topic without annoying someone. Whatever your position... As with every discussing any topic, especially on the internet. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't consider it. I've learned that some people really dislike speaking about anything that seems improbable or hypothetical or is a thought experiment, but that's not me, so. Discussion of mind upload has to begin with the brain. The brain in a nutshell. The brain is the most complex biological structure known and deserves its own entire video, so let's just take a brief look at it. Good luck. Around 100 billion neurons are communicating via 1 million billion connections that are sending signals up to 1,000 times each second, which is one quadrillion events every second of your waking life. And it's not just neurons, there are billions of supporting and immune cells of various types performing different jobs. On a macro level, the brain can be divided into sections with different roles, from breathing and heart rate to coordinating movement and involuntary reflexes. The most developed parts, the neocortex or the outermost layer of the brain, hold memories, our ability to plan, think and imagine, hope and dream. I wonder if there's a correlation between people who tend to hope less or are not very imaginative and the wiring in their neocortex or if it has to do with their past experiences and temperament and any of the other factors that might affect how somebody's mind works. Maybe it's a mix. And now I'm gonna have to <laughs> look for a study to see if anybody has attempted to find that out. Where exactly the you part of the brain is situated is not entirely clear. 
We know that areas like the precuneus cortex have the greatest influence on our consciousness, but also that several areas can network together to share tasks none of them can do alone. The brain's building blocks are not exactly simple either. Neurons are not just wires, they alter and process information. Synapses, where signals are handed over from one neuron to the next, contain receptors for hundreds of chemical signals, opening them up to outside influence. We have a basic understanding of how these work, and we can accurately predict their behavior at small scales, but there's a lot more to the brain than just nerve signals. Hormones play a huge role, like serotonin, which affects our mood, or histamine, which helps us learn. The brain is influenced by our other parts too, from heart nerves to gut bacteria. What seemed like a very complicated system to begin with gets even more complicated the more we learn about it. To get this wildly interconnected mess of cells and meat and chemicals into a computer, we need a model that we can simulate in our digital world. Some sort of scan. Unfortunately, our scanning technology, like fMRI machines, is not nearly good enough to attempt such a thing. But there is a different method that seems very promising. Cutting a brain into tiny slices and scanning them with a high-resolution electron microscope to create an accurate map of all the cells and connections. In 2019, scientists successfully science. mapped a cubic millimeter of mouse brain, roughly the size of a big grain of sand. It contained 100,000 neurons with a billion synapses and four kilometers of nerve fibers. This grain of brain was cut into 25,000 slices. Five electron microscopes ran continuously for five months, collecting more than 100 million images. It took three months to assemble the images into a 3D model. The completed data set fills up two million gigabytes of cloud storage. To scan a whole human brain, we would have to repeat this effort a million times, which is much easier said than done. Even worse, to correctly simulate a brain, we might even have to map out much smaller building blocks to include the billions of underlying proteins or even individual molecules that cause all the behaviors we see at the cellular level, which might produce more data than the capacity of all data storage on Earth. Brain water to consciousness wine. While all of these issues are annoying, the real question is how we turn the static blueprint of the brain into an active thing. Even if we have a scan, down to the level of synapses, we need laws and rules that animate the wiring diagram to endow this static structure with life, update it with the various laws of chemical binding, of electrodynamics, to animate the simulation. So it becomes a dynamic active thing like a brain that exists from one microsecond to the next that can evolve in time, think, see, and act. The reality is that we just don't know if this is possible to achieve. If our technology can give rise to real minds. It all hinges on the nature of the problem. Are the brain and mind just complicated and a lot of work to figure out? Or are they complex in a way that we can't solve? In the worst case, consciousness is more than the sum of the parts of the brain in a way that we don't realize yet. Complex in a way that we can't solve by getting better scans. Just having a list of the ingredients might not be enough to get a good consciousness cake. Right now, we have a great starting point with tangible scientific results and an end goal, but the road to true simulation is unclear and requires a lot of innovation and research. Humans have historically been horrible at predicting the pace of progress. In the best case, it's just a matter of doing the work and finding the right solutions. It might not be necessary to simulate every last cell down to the last atom. Instead, it may be possible to simplify elements into probabilistic models that could match the behavior of the brain using a more manageable number of simpler systems. So we really don't know if we will ever understand our brain and consciousness well enough to upload human minds. But the science is real and worth pursuing. At the very least, we will just learn a lot about ourselves and develop a bunch of new technologies. If we succeed, this point. might put mind uploading well within the capabilities of our rapidly progressing computer technology. The consequences mm. for humanity and our future in this universe are vast, creepy, and amazing. The copy.
Successful mind uploading is functional immortality. Unless damaged or deleted, you will continue to exist as long as a copy is stored somewhere. Of course, if the scan is corrupted in any of a myriad of ways, your mind might get corrupted too. You might be in an eternity of pain or paranoia or having an endless psychotic breakdown. The question if this digital mind is you opens another whole can of worms. For now, we'll just assume that your digital mind at least feels like it's you. This is a question that I always have as it relates to any type of mind upload. Are you still you once you've uploaded your mind or are you just, to keep it brief, an uploaded version of you? Do you need the body and the mind to make it you or is your consciousness enough? It leads to a philosophical question, really. There's just, I could think about it for ages and there's really just no answer. How would mind uploading change your outlook on life? Will you feel safer knowing that death is not necessarily the end? Or would you try to be super safe to avoid dying before your mind is uploaded? If scanning technology does become advanced enough, your biological and digital versions could coexist. You could help each other out by making your biological lifespan more enjoyable and the future of the copy more secure. Whatever happens, your mind copy will begin a the copy ages. new life once it opens their digital eyes for the first time. Having a functional body is actually quite nice and you're pretty used to it. Food, love, pain and exhaustion, all of these things are parts of us that we must live with. But in the end, they are the result of neurons firing in your brain. So while you could decide to live in a simulated body, it might be optional for a digital mind. Falling in love might lose meaning if you can have it at the press of a button. Instead, you might mm. end up searching for new extraordinary experiences. Walk on the surface of the Is sun. That's something like Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Sex becomes so common in that world that it's desensitized. It just becomes passionless. So in the case of love, would it still be something to pursue if you could have it whenever you wanted and there was no risk involved? Or would it also become passionless? And then that line of thinking continues, right? Because if you could be happy all of the time, does being happy matter? And if it doesn't, then what do you do about that vacuum? But yeah, as you said, maybe there is a whole myriad of other sensations to pursue in your digital form. Speed up time to skip past a few boring months. Experience a simulation of the past. Your perspectives and priorities will change as you continue to exist in this liberated form. The longer digital minds exist, eventually they will likely gain greater knowledge of themselves and an ability to change their own contents. This can be as simple as deleting a memory that bugs you. You might change aspects of your personality, like grudges, addictions or laziness. Without the constraints of biology, your abilities might move up as technology progresses, while your priorities or goals might become more and more foreign to your original brain if it's still alive. Waking up to the true potential of digital immortality will be gradual. You can start projects that would take more than a lifetime to complete. Scientists could accumulate an incredible amount of knowledge, leading to discoveries that could revolutionize the world. Those Adventurers could upload positives. themselves onto small spaceships and embark on journeys to the stars, just putting themselves on pause for thousands of years at a time. Although it's unlikely that every digital mind will work for the benefit of humanity, since our current meat versions don't do that either. Some will seek power and influence and will have a literal eternity of trying to create empires. Others will begin hoarding as many resources for themselves as possible as they compete with other minds trying to do the same. The longer they live, the less sympathy they may feel for simple meat beings. Or imagine immortal cult leaders who propagate lies and invent religions, fine-tuning and perfecting their dogma over hundreds of years. Or perhaps none of all that. Maybe our minds are not made for immortality, and digital minds will just become rigid and unproductive and retire after a very long life, having experienced everything they could ever want to. 
It's hard to predict how much good or bad a self-improving mind could do with hundreds or thousands of years of free time. While mind upload with all, all its right. wonders That's and horrors game. is be Believe it or not, that was my favorite video from this channel so far. The second one being the simulation theory, which is very similar. But this one had me thinking that the search for immortality is such an answer to a human's fear of death. Personally, I hope to die one day, and more than likely I will. And not because I don't like my life or because I don't want to live anymore, but because that's the cycle. Or the ending, who knows? But the thought of death is what keeps me active. What I mean by that is, if I had a perpetual tomorrow, I think my sense of urgency would be gone. I would just keep putting off the things that I want to do because I know that I could do it tomorrow or the next day or the next month. At one point, he mentioned how you could have the option to skip the boring months. And I wondered how that would affect personal development. And thinking that through, he touched on this at the end. It's like, what implications will that have on somebody's morality or the morality of the individual? But maybe that's where our instant gratification society is taking us. Skip what's hard, avoid risk, simulate reality because reality is finite and oftentimes difficult. But on the other side of that, I am not blind to some of the potential positives. And I don't think that everyone should think like me. I agree that technology probably would have the opportunity to advance at a faster rate if time weren't a factor. And we could have more time to explore space and the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. Other examples that I'd probably have to sit down to pull out of my head. So I do understand why other people would want to upload their minds. But after watching this whole thing, I still wouldn't want to do that to mine. So for a literary recommendation, I'll just choose this book because I've already mentioned it, but it's not the best as far as relevance. And that's Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. I've read it in the past. I'm actually listening to a free audiobook version of it now here on YouTube. So I'll make sure to link that for you. But reading about dystopian societies always do interest me because it does lead to these philosophical questions and moral dilemmas. So that's all I've got. There's a lot to talk about on this one. Leave your thoughts on any of it. And thanks for watching with me.